audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Coming up today on The Story. I didn't realise that this friend of ours was a witnessing Christian. I was walking along the beach and I had a revelation of God and I became aware of the reality of God all around me, the creator of the universe, and it was profound. And what I didn't realise was that at that very same moment, further up the beach, Sharon was giving her life to Christ as a result of the witnessing of her friend. The Story G'day, I'm Jimmy Colfax. Welcome to The Story. Well, Logan Anderson is quite the world traveller. He was born in New Zealand, then migrated to Australia before heading off to various parts of the world doing ministry. He's also travelled a lot as far as his occupation is concerned. He's migrated from environmental planning and landscape architecture to being a pastor and starting an international ministry. We'll hear Logan's multinational life story today as he has a chat with Karen Hunt. So tell us, were you actually born in New Zealand or somewhere else? I was born in New Zealand in Auckland and uh, my father at that time uh, wasn't well. He passed away when I was just 18 months old. Mm. But I have uh, two older sisters and an older brother and they, along with my mother, were our family. So your mum certainly had her hands full by the sound of it, hey? She certainly did. She devoted her life to raising us as a family and we've always been very close, although I am by some way the youngest in the family. (laughs) There you go. So faith within your family culture from that young age, was it always there? What did it look like? It's a little unusual. Uh, My grandparents were missionaries in the king country in the centre of the North Island of New Zealand in the earlier part of last century. And my father grew into that environment and became himself a minister in the Salvation Army. World War II came along, this is many years ago now, and he put that aside and pursued other interests. And when I was born in 1956, he wasn't that well, and as I said earlier, he he passed away, and Mm. I was still a baby at the time. Was your mum also involved with the Salvos? No, she wasn't. Uh, in, In fact, She and my father were involved in the Apostolic Church in later years and I grew into that environment without fully understanding why or what it was all about. I didn't really know God at all personally until I turned about 12 or 13. So before reaching that age and heading into adolescence, your childhood years, what did you love? What were you good at? What was Logan developing into as a person? Even as a five or six year old, we would walk to school. Me and my mates would take a shortcut through the, the, the rubbish dump. There was a, a freedom and a sense of safety about children in society mm-hmm. in those days. No one drove their kids to school. Sometimes I'd catch the bus, sometimes I'd just walk with my friends. We had a a freedom to spend time in each other's places and not have to tell anyone where we were. Like many young New Zealand boys, I enjoyed playing my rugby and and we lived close to the beach and that was also uh, an important part of our lifestyle. Did you have any idea what you maybe wanted to be when you grew up? I had a, a desire at one stage to be a farmer and another desire to be an architect. And, and they converged in later years mm. with uh, my, my landscape architecture and permaculture, designing farms and so on. What was your mum into at the time? She had a hands full. Yeah, I bet. Raising us and uh, devoted to her grandchildren when they came along with my older sisters and my older brother. That was her life of dedication the family, children and grandchildren. So here you are in Auckland, 12 years of age, 13 years of age, something pretty important happened. Can you tell us about that? My mother and her sister took me to a Billy Graham crusade Mm. and it was uh, at a stadium and there were a lot of people there and I remember it was a beautiful summer evening. I don't remember anything about the sermon, but at the end of it, there was something that happened in the spirit. 
and I was lifted up by something invisible, angels, Holy Spirit, I don't know, but I was literally lifted up and carried out to the altar, something beyond my control, beyond my understanding, powerfully spiritual, changed me. How did it change you? It was the realisation that something, someone bigger, more powerful, spiritual, was real. And I was touched, touched from within. And I never, ever forgot that. But I was not grounded in a church as a result of that salvation experience. And from 12 or 13, despite the memory of that experience, I just became another naughty teenage boy. I was going to say, at that age, that's quite an impressionable age for something like that to happen to you. How did that impact your life, even through those cheeky, naughty times? I initially sought to find a church. I couldn't drive, and it was an independent decision of mine. But there was that lack of discipling, that lack of taking care of a new young Christian. I never knew or experienced youth groups or anything like that. And so my my love and my passion that had been ignited with that experience, it diminished. And from there I went on to play rugby and drink beer and smoke cigarettes and do what young lads do. So trying to find your place in your world? Just trying to enjoy life and be like other people. And yet I knew there was a difference. Logan, you mentioned schooling and uh, exploring life as a, a boy turning into a young man. Someone was going to school with you that you weren't even really aware of until I believe a very special game of tennis happened. Tell me, was the score love all? <laughs> my wife, Sharon. <laughs> Wasn't your wife at this time? Not my wife at that time, no. We were part of a, a group of very close friends who had play tennis usually every evening and all weekend and from that friendship they developed after a while it wasn't immediate after a while a a, a closeness that became love and it was love maybe not for all but it was love for the two of us (laughs) did you have shared interests other than the tennis we were playing tennis except when it rained and we'd play cards yeah And there there wasn't at that stage a lot of interest outside that social activity and that social group. We would start to go out for meals as a group and eventually just the two of us. And from there, I was certain that this was to be my life mate, my life partner. And we weren't even going out at the time, but we eventually did and we got married. So you knew her? I knew. Yeah. And did she have a faith of her own in those early times? She had an Anglican upbringing Mm -hmm. and uh, went through all of the the, the culture and the the teaching associated with the Anglican church. But but like me, there, there wasn't that sense of spiritual connection. That happened a little bit later. And were you a part of that? What happened was, was most unusual. We got married. We bought a farm, fulfilling one of my life's ambitions and desires, Mm -hmm. and we established a commercial herb nursery in organics. And our first child was born, and this was our lifestyle. It was quite worldly, a little bit new age, and it uh, provided us with a, a real sense of home, a real sense of place. But there were things missing. We had special friends who lived in the Bay of Plenty in New Zealand, and we went with them on a holiday. And it was 1987, it was November, and I had no thought at all of God. And I was walking along the beach, and Sharon was walking with our friend along the beach, about 100 metres away. And I didn't realise that this friend of ours was a, a witnessing Christian. And I was walking along the beach, distanced from them, and I had a revelation of God. And I became aware of the reality of God all around me, the creator of the universe, the physicist, the chemist, the biologist, the artist, the musician, the geologist, the creator God. And it was profound. And it was a wake up. 
And what I didn't realise was that at that very same moment, further up the beach, Sharon was giving her life to Christ as a result of the witnessing of her friend. It happened at the same time, and we were unaware of what was happening to each other. That's very special. What's more, we remained unaware because I didn't say anything to Sharon, and she didn't say anything to me. That evening, the day of that experience for me, I went out onto the deck of the place where we were staying to have a smoke, as you do, and God spoke to me so clearly. And I heard the voice of God. He said, son, you've got to make some changes in your life. He said, I want you to give up smoking. I said, all right. I knew who it was, and I was powerless to refuse. And he he said, you're to do it this way. You're to give up as though you've never smoked. It's totally removed from your life. It's gone. Don't be judgmental of other people. Easy to do? It was because of the grace of God Mm. in that life-changing experience. And, and, And so what happened was my lifestyle changed, even though I hadn't discussed it with my wife. And she raised the issue. What's happened to you? And then we compared notes and we saw what happened at that moment on the beach the week before. You're listening to The Story. Today, Karen Hunt is having a chat with Logan Anderson, founder of Visionary Ministries International. We'll hear more of his story when we return. The Story. If this program has highlighted something you'd like prayer for, we'd love to pray for you. Call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. It's a free call. Or text 0401-132-888. Hi, I'm Jimmy Colfax and this is The Story. We're continuing with Karen Hunt chatting with Logan Anderson, who is the founder of Visionary Ministries International. Before the break, we heard how Logan and his wife simultaneously had life-changing encounters with God. Now we're going to hear what happened next in their lives. Where did that take you guys? We, we had our hippie farm. Yeah. I used to dress pretty crazy in those days. You still do. Look at you, you got your groovy green pants on and your pink socks and your and your white suspenders. Is this radio in colour? <laughs> <laughs> no, is it going I love out it. in colour? Creativity is a spice of life. <laughs> well, it's the creativity of God that came to me mm. a revelation of the reality of who he was. Mm-hmm. And then he spoke to me that evening. And so as a result of that and the decision of my wife. We joined a local church. Together. Together. Yeah. And we were rejected because we were weird. And, and so initially that, that first few months after what really was true conversion for us, we, we struggled and we received prophetic direction to go to a, a Pentecostal church in our hometown and we responded to that and I found that easier than Sharon who didn't have the earlier experiences of that church Mm -hmm. culture. But we settled into this Pentecostal church, and through the discipleship and the friendship and the the spiritual equipping, we eventually became assistant pastors in that church about six or eight years after our conversion. So this is a a New Life Church of New Zealand? That's That's the branding name? That's correct. A church stream with a very strong prophetic, teaching heritage, and we imbibed of that and uh, were beneficiaries of the anointing of that prophetic teaching. I'm just curious to know, did you happen to keep the commercial herb nursery? We, we did initially. I was operating at that time a consultancy in permaculture, and permaculture is an acronym for permanent agriculture, but it's really about sustainable community passive energy systems, appropriate technology, and in itself, it's a a means to bring about community transformation. I didn't realise it at the time, but that was going to play an important part of my vision for missions later on. You had this commercial herb nursery. You're becoming more involved in, in pastoring in the Auckland area. 
But you ended up in Australia and later on you ended up in Europe and here you are again now in Australia. Tell us what happened. Okay, here's the story. I asked someone for a prophetic word many years ago, something I never do, I've learned not to do, and, and the prophet said to me, Armenia, Macedonia. There's a Macedonian call on your life. It's both spiritual and literal. And I thought, well, nothing of that. I just put it aside and really forgot about it. But in pastoring, I became interested in completing a master's in missions and ministry. Mm -hmm. And, And part of that involved doing a course called Perspectives, which is a missions awareness course. And I took this course, and my wife Sharon took it with me, and it changed my life. It totally turned me around in terms of my headspace in regards to what God's will for our lives are. Although I was pastoring at the time, I just had to teach this course, and I actually stopped my study to pick up the opportunity to teach this course to others. And in the process, I I began to discover a, a teaching gifting on my life. And I became involved in teaching in Bible colleges in New Zealand. And that came through in my passion for missions that began to grow. And I became involved in short-term missions out of New Zealand and so on. But I I never thought about this Macedonia, Europe, Eastern Europe thing for quite some time. But what I did do is after we pastored our own church for eight years and we, we handed that over, We had a special project with a Korean girl, and that was our ministry for a couple of years, helping rebuild her into the amazing young woman that she is now. And she, along with our birth daughter and son, became our family uh, in more recent years. So some would say a spiritual daughter as such. Absolutely a spiritual daughter. And incidentally, the same birthday and birth year, as my daughter, so they're like twins. Oh, that's nice. Same, same birthday. Anyway, what happened is my daughter and, and her husband and at that time young son, my grandson, they came over here to live in Australia and uh, my other son Reuben, he followed six months later and although there was a desire for us also to relocate here to Australia, it took a prophetic word, a, a prophetic direction for us to make a decision, believing it to be God's will for our lives, not just a personal desire to follow the family. Mm -hmm. We came over here to Australia about five and a half years ago and looking to do the work of the ministry in in a more strategic way. And missions was to be a part of that and to minister and exercise the teaching gifting on our lives. And it didn't seem to go anywhere, that the doors were closed, the opportunities weren't there, and, and we were uh, a little confused as to why God called us here. But we heard a minister who had been ministering in Eastern Europe talking about the needs over there for, for teaching, for community work, and so on. And although I did not recall at that moment that prophetic word I'd received many years earlier, something really stirred my spirit. And for no reason, water would start squirting out of my eyes whenever the conversation Mm -hmm. came to Eastern Europe. And and it was unusual because I didn't feel emotional. I'd be talking and talking just like this and quite happy to do so and not be emotionally affected except puddles of water were forming on the, on the, the ground in front of me. And I realise, of course, that's the, uh, the spirit and not necessarily the, the soul or the mind or emotions. So we decided that we will go to Eastern Europe and funding and provision had, had been promised, but it, it never eventuated. Mm-hmm. Of course, it's always easy to go and do something when someone writes out a cheque. And, and so we were frustrated because things weren't happening the way we thought they should. And I mentioned to us and Reuben, if we go over to Europe, do you want to come over to Europe? Do you want to come with us? And he said, yes, yes. And we thought it would be great for him to expand his, his vision and that as well. So in 2011, it was a February Sunday morning, and Sharon and I, we sat down with a coffee, and we made a decision. Look, we're going. We're not going to wait for 
provision. We're not going to see how things outside our control line up. We're going to go. We're going to sell a couple of cars, everything we don't need. We're just going to go. And we agreed to do that. But what is amazing is within 48 hours, we had five very powerful confirming experiences. Mm -hmm. The first one was we were given notice with the house we were staying in that was to be put on the market for sale and we were given notice to move out. Time to get out of there. Our our son Reuben was was given notice in terms of where he was working Mm -hmm. at the time. We received two other words of prophetic confirmation. But the most amazing thing is this is all within 48 hours of us deciding we're going to go. We received an invitation from a minister in Europe. Come over. We need you. We can provide you with accommodation, with a vehicle, with food. It was the Macedonian call. Mm. And we just felt, this is it. Yeah. And we went. And 2011 for us is just the most amazing experience. We were based in Brussels for the most part. We ended up setting up Bible schools, overseeing a Congolese church in one town, Mm -hmm. ministering to Filipino fellowships in other towns Mm -hmm. in Antwerp, Mm -hmm. and also into Germany, and running a cafe at one stage, uh, doing street evangelism, writing a lot of teaching material, networking apostolically to coordinate uh, different pastors from different churches, and we just loved it. We had to come home. But the doors opened for us, and we so look forward to going back there and into Eastern Europe to establish their ministry training for church planters. That's our desire. So the visas ran out for that time, for oh, that yes. season. Mm-hmm. You're back here in Australia now. When do you foresee that you might return to Eastern Europe or Europe as it is now? Okay. Uh, our desire is been every year for the last few years, <laughs> sure. but we've, we've been on a, a, another path as well, mm-hmm. and we've been seeking God, and God's been extending us and expanding us in the area of the prophetic and uh, uh, angelic experiences, and, and so for this short season at the moment, we are re-equipping, but part of that re-equipping has is, is also been through our local church, becoming involved in teaching missions, imparting, and providing strategic support. And that is continuing to open out, unfold on greater scale, which has strong missions implications, not only in Europe, but in Africa, India, Fiji, Philippines, Mm -hmm. Papua New Guinea. And we have a heart for all of these places. I felt challenged by God to not restrict my vision. And, and felt to ask of him the nations. Mm. And, and that's extended for me a vision that, that is truly global. And so that frees me up to go anywhere where there's an open door and where God says, go here, go there. So currently you feel you're being re-equipped in preparation for your strategic purpose, but at the same time, your passion is for missions, your passion is for teaching and equipping other young ministries to also fulfill the Great Commission. Would that be right? Very much so. Logan, I love your passion. I wish you and Sharon well, all your family as well. May God uh, continue to guide you and protect you as you seek further his purposes for you. Thank you very much. It's been an honour. Oh, thanks Bless for you. your time. Bless you too, mate. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. That was Karen Hunt having a chat with Logan Anderson, who was the founder of Visionary Ministries International. And it was great to hear how God worked in his and his wife's life, taking them on great ministry adventures to various parts of the world. As the Bible says in Proverbs, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. And in the case of Logan Anderson... He'll make your paths go all over the world. To find out more about Logan and his ministry, the website is visionaryministries.net. That's visionaryministries.net. Well, thanks for joining us for Logan's Story. I'm Jimmy Colfax, encouraging you to share your story with someone today. 
the story. Just another way vision is connecting faith to life. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.